thank you so much for being here today. As you know, this is a special occasion for us. Every Sunday is special around here, but this one is especially special. Amen. That's because we're celebrating our second anniversary as North Point. God has brought us so far, so fast. I often tell people this has to be a God thing. Amen. We're not that good. And to go from nothing to this with great things on the horizon... We just wanted to gather together to worship Him and to praise Him and to celebrate Him. Amen. God has been so good to us and we're so glad that you're here to celebrate with us. A couple of things. First, the baby boom continues. Yeah. Sonny Swisher was born on Wednesday. Yeah. Mama and baby are doing fine. They were discharged from the hospital. Thankfully, she looks like her mama. <laughs> But um, it's like we had a wave of babies last year. We have a wave of babies this year. I don't know how we're doing with other verses in the Bible, but I think we have Genesis 128 down pat. Be <laughs> fruitful and multiply. <laughs> People are going to mistake us for a nursery. But it's great. We praise God for that. Also, Stephen Yeager has returned. Oh, yeah. Stephen, yeah. Stephen was our summer intern, and he went back to Denver to complete his courses at Bear Valley Bible Institute. His desire is to serve in ministry as a counselor. So he's moved back. He's going to work with us while completing his counseling courses. And so we welcome Stephen back. And at this time, he has no idea I'm doing this. But at this time, I want to ask Tracy Waldridge to come up and join me on stage. Tracy is our family minister. He also serves as one of our elders. Not only is this our second anniversary as North Point, this is his second anniversary with North Point. When I started this work, I knew that if I was going to be a successful leader, I needed to surround myself with people more talented than me. <laughs> and uh, that's why we got Caleb. That's why we got Tracy. Tracy is a gifted speaker. He has the Barnabas effect, he's a great encourager, and he has a servant's heart. And so Tracy, the elders wanted to, to give you this certificate of appreciation. Appreciate you. Look at Bob Naylor for me. <laughs> and your wife, it was really hard for her to keep a secret. Your wife said you like Drake's, so dinner's on us. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> As we celebrate our anniversary, paying tribute to God for all that He has done, is doing, and will do for this church, I thought we'd begin by looking at a story in Genesis chapter 18. Back in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 18, the time when God dropped by to see His friend Abraham. Abraham was a good friend to God, and I say that for good reason. Three times Abraham is called God's friend. He is the only individual in Scripture with that designation. On this occasion, God and two angels, all in the form of humans, suddenly show up at Abraham's doorstep. Let's begin in chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves. And after that you may pass on, since you've come to your servant. So they said... Do as you have said. In this text, Abraham is enjoying a little R&R &R at the door of his tent. No doubt trying to get some shade, enjoy a gentle breeze, probably dozing off a bit. When suddenly he opened his eyes and there were three men standing before him. Now I'm sure that Abraham was initially shocked by their sudden appearance. 
but he immediately shifted into host mode. He got up, ran himself to the men, fell down before them, extended hospitality to them. He said, please, please, let me get you some water to drink and to wash your feet with. Let me get you some bread to eat. And the men accepted. Now we have to understand that hospitality in the Near East was considered a sacred duty. It was a moral obligation to provide for your guests' needs and safety while they were at your house. What I think is especially cool is that Abraham was a hundred years old. He was an elderly man. And yet when he saw these guys suddenly appear at his doorstep, he jumped up. He ran to them. He bowed before them. Unknowing at this time that it was God and angels he was entertaining. It reminds me of Hebrews 13 verse 2, which says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. The Hebrews writer obviously had Abraham in mind. There was a Catholic priest in Bardstown, Kentucky, who had an unexpected visitor stop by one day, a stranger. And the priest extended hospitality to him for several months. The stranger made no effort to contribute anything to the struggling parish. And when he finally left, all he said was thanks. But a few years later, a large shipment of some of the world's most beautiful paintings arrived at the little church. It turns out the stranger was a prince of France in exile. And when he finally returned home, one of the first things he did was send a royal gift to the parish priest. Isn't that amazing? He unknowingly showed hospitality to a prince. But in this text, Abraham unknowingly showed hospitality to the prince. That is the Prince of Peace. Amen. Well, let's pick up in verse 6. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. When the, when the guests agreed to stay, Abraham jumped into action. Again, keep in mind that he was about a hundred years old. Sarah was about 90. But when they agreed to stay, Abraham jumped up, he ran into the tent and said to his wife, get to cooking. We've got guests and we need to make them dinner. You make the cakes while I grill the burgers. He then served the food to the men as he stood by as their personal waiter. Did you notice that? Abraham didn't eat with his guests. He watched them eat. Again, hospitality was a sacred duty. Not only is this remarkable considering his age, but we also consider his status. Abraham was extremely wealthy. He had tons of servants. Isn't it impressive that he didn't summon a servant? Hey, hey, we've got guests. Get busy. Make some cakes. Make some food. Kill the calf. Serve these people. He didn't do that. He didn't call for a servant to do it. He did it. And as they were eating, one of the men asked, Hey, where's Sarah at? Abraham replied, Well, she's in the tent. This would not have been uncommon. In that culture, women would not eat at a table full of men. They were unseen and unheard unless needed. And so this must have been a little odd of a question. Where's your wife at? Well, 
you know, she's in the tent. And then the man made a stunning statement, a bold prediction. He said, surely I will return this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was eavesdropping, and she heard what the man said. This must have been the moment that Abraham began to realize that this man is not just a man. You see, Abraham had been visited by God and was told that he would one day have a child of promise, but he wasn't given a definite time. Now this stranger says, guess what, you're going to have a baby by this time next year. Verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, you, you did laugh. Now, verse 11 is a parenthetical statement of sorts. The writer wants us to know how absurd this would be under normal circumstances. Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. I'd say so. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. This seems like an absolute impossibility. And it's no wonder that Sarah laughed to herself in doubt. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a baby. But the man knew that she had laughed. And he said to Abraham, why is your wife laughing? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I'm going to come back this time next year and you will have a child. He even tells him it's going to be a boy. Sarah emerges from the tent door and says, oh, oh no, 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 I, I wasn't laughing. And the Lord gives her a gentle but firm rebuke. Y yeah, you were. <laughs> you were laughing. Well, what I want to hone in on today is the rhetorical question that the Lord asked. He asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Okay, Abraham, you're a hundred, your wife is ninety, but I'm the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the obvious answer is no. Amen. I mean, this is the same Lord who spoke the universe into existence. This is the same Lord who parted the Red Sea. This is the same Lord who provided manna from heaven. This is the same Lord who brought down the walls of Jericho. This is the same Lord who made the sun stand still. Amen. This is the same Lord who preserved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace and Jonah from the belly of the great fish. This is the same Lord who shut the mouths of lions and opened the eyes of the blind. Amen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? If he could make a donkey talk and a lame man walk, surely he could grant an elderly couple the ability to have a baby. Amen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? He not only implies the answer is no, he proves the answer is no. Look at Genesis 21 verses 1 and 2. The Lord visited Sarah... As he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Nothing is too hard or too heavy or too horrible for the Lord. He makes the difficult look easy 
and the impossible seem predictable. Therefore, brethren, it shouldn't surprise us at all that the Lord has brought North Point this far, this fast. You look around and sadly, across the board, regardless of your denomination, churches are dwindling on the vine. Their numbers are going down and down and down. More and more church buildings are going up for sale because the church had to close. And yet God took a few nobodies, put them in a place where they knew nobody, and he showed that nothing is too hard for the Lord. He has blessed us. He has given the increase. He has caused us to grow beyond our wildest imaginations. And again, that shouldn't surprise us. This is the same Lord who flooded the whole earth with water. This is the same Lord who consumed entire cities with fire and sulfur. This is the same Lord who reduced a powerful king to eating grass like an ox. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Why then do we seem surprised? And I'll admit, there are times I look around and I'm surprised. Like if this is a dream, don't pinch me. At a time when younger people in particular, but folks across the board, aren't interested in church and religious things. People are driving from counties to be here. Amen. God is doing something special. And it just reminds me that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. If He can count the numbers, the number of hairs on your head, surely He can build up a church. If He can turn rivers to blood and cause a darkness to fall upon the land of Egypt so intense that you could feel it, surely He can cause a church to grow. Amen. And that's what we're celebrating today. Amen. This is a God thing. It has to be. I'm not that good and you're not that good. And yet look around at what God is doing. And so quickly, I just want to kind of bring you up to speed on our story. I'll begin with our past. In 2015, at the very end of 2015, Jill and I were contemplating just moving to another state to work with a new church when she suggested driving out to Spencer County. To me, Spencer County was like a foreign country. But we came out here late one Sunday night, and as we drove up to Elk Creek, we saw a building with a four lease sign in the window. We called the number, the man answered, and we said, look, we're thinking about starting a church out here, but we have very limited resources. The man said, you know what? I would love for a church to go in this building. I'll work with you on the rent. Well, I started talking to a few friends from our previous congregation, and they agreed to help us make this a reality. One of those men was Harold Byers Jr. If you didn't know Harold Byers Jr., he passed away several years ago. He is a hallmark of this church and always will be. Amen. He has left a lasting legacy. In fact, our welcome center is named after him. On the north sidewalk, there's a brick in the ground dedicated to him. Amen. Harold said, Aaron, I'll help you start that work. And by the grace of God, we were able to get that building. This is what it looked like on the exterior. This is what it looked like on the interior after we got it ready to go. It had been a beauty salon. It served as our first church building. We called ourselves at that time the Taylorsville Church of Christ. And God gave the increase. Amen. Beyond our wildest imaginations, people started showing up. We started baptizing people, and the church grew and grew and grew. It grew so much that we knew we got to find a bigger place. 
That's when we moved to our second location, closer to downtown Taylorsville. Now, I know this seems smaller, but actually it was larger on the inside, gave us more room for an auditorium. This is what that auditorium looked like. Now, I must say that it hasn't always been smooth sailing. We've had our share of challenges and obstacles. After our first service in that second building... I showed up for work on Monday, and there was a big orange sticker on the door. State of Kentucky. Stop work immediately. Come to find out, one of our members had been doing some work on a classroom, and somebody reported him for not having a permit. We had such a great first service in that second building. I got up that morning on a high, and now there's a stop work order on the door. I was devastated. I called Harold. He called the state. The state said, we are so far behind, it's going to be six months before we can even look at you. I thought, man, things are going so well. We're growing so fast, and now we can't even use our building? I called the school superintendent. He was a friend of mine, and he said, you you can use one of the elementary school gymnasiums. But I knew it wouldn't be the same. Meanwhile, Harold had talked to his neighbor who said, I know a guy you might want to call. His name is Doug White. Doug is here today. Doug has been a friend of this church. He has gone above and beyond for us. But I must admit that when I first got his name and number, I disregarded it. I thought, what's he going to do? Well, Doug's spunky. (laughs) <laughs> Doug, <laughs> if you know Doug, you know I'm telling the truth. He's relentless. And when we finally reached out to Doug, he went to work. We still had to spend 10 weeks in an elementary school gymnasium, but 10 weeks is a lot better than six months. Amen. We got to thank Doug White for that. Well, when we got back into our building, the floodgates opened up again. God gave the increase, and we kept growing and growing, even during the heart of COVID. Yeah. We were growing and growing and growing. We knew that we're going to have to have another building. A larger building, hopefully a permanent building. And even though we really couldn't afford it, we were able to purchase this land and then get a loan to build this building. And two years ago this weekend, we launched what we now call North Point. That's where we were. Let's talk about our present. From day one, the members here have had a mind to work. We didn't become stagnant or complacent. We wanted to fill this building up. And by the grace of God, that's what we were able to do. We have a baptistry and we're not afraid to use it. (laughs) In the first year, we had 30 baptisms to God's glory. Yeah, praise God for that. He has continued to bless us. Three things in particular I wanted to mention. I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but three things in particular. We were able to launch North Point Homeschool Academy. We launched it last year. I was blown away by how many people showed up. We had over 60 students last year. We're going to have over 100 students at the start of this year. Not only are we connecting with our community, but every day those kids are hearing God's Word. They're hearing God's word in their classes. They're hearing God's word in a devo. We've had a baptism from it. Several families have been visiting from it. The North Point Homeschool Academy has been such a blessing. We also started a second campus. We call it North Point PRP. It's out on Terry Road in southwest Louisville. We've already had a couple of baptisms out there. We have new visitors And as we announced last week, my oldest son, Luke Earhart, has decided to enter ministry. And he's spending a couple of days a week out at PRP. By the way, he's already made a few connections out there. And so we're excited about where PRP will go. And, if you couldn't tell when you came in today, we're under construction. On the north end of this building, we're going to erect a new auditorium 
We're hoping it'll seat about 500 comfortably. We're adding a new entrance and parking lot. This church is booming. Amen. And we want to make sure that we're ready for it. Amen. We don't want to be reactive. We want to be proactive. And so you see that taking place right now. This isn't to our glory. This is to God's glory. Amen. Well, then that leads me to the final point, our future. What does our future hold? I don't know. But I do know that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. I do know that God has blessed us in the past. He's blessing us in the present. And I have no reason to doubt He'll bless us in the future. Amen. Amen. I am confident the best is yet to come if we continue to do these five things. You ready? Number one, maintain our unity. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 25, that a house divided against itself will not stand. Amen. The devil is going to try to divide and conquer. So many churches have suffered from that, haven't they? Things are going pretty well, and then the devil rears his ugly head. A schism occurs. It is vitally important. It is absolutely imperative that we recognize the threat and stay united. We need to stay together. We need to be a cohesive unit. Alone we will fail. Together we will never fail. Amen. Number two, we need to maintain our vision. This church has always been a forward-looking church. From its inception, we're always looking ahead. What can we do next? Sadly, a lot of churches spend all their time looking in the rearview mirror. You know what I'm talking about. Boy, back in the day, we had so many members. Back in the day, we were baptizing people. They spend all their time looking backwards to God's glory. This church has never looked backwards. We've always looked forward. We've always asked, what can we do next? You see, the message never changes, but our methods can and should change. And this church is willing to use different methods to reach the lost. Amen. We've had a vision of what could be. And I pray that never changes. Number three, we need to maintain our work ethic. I am happy to say that this church is filled with workers. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and sweat a little bit. Like Isaiah, when called upon, they reply, Here am I, send me. Do you remember when ne Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? And by the grace of God, with hard work from people, they were able to rebuild the walls in just 52 days. Can you even imagine? How were they able to do that? How were they able to go so far so fast? Well, number one, God was on their side. But number two, Nehemiah 4 verse 6 provides the answer. We're told that they had a mind to work. Not a mind to watch, not a mind to whine, they had a mind to work. From our inception, the members of this church have had a mind to work, and I pray it continues. Amen. Number four, we must maintain our love of truth. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. Everything we do must center around the truth of God's word. And to his glory... We have been dedicated to truth. We're going to stand with God regardless of the consequences. And believe me, there have been consequences. Standing for the truth is not always easy. There's always that temptation to compromise, to water down, to pull back. If we believe it, we're going to stand upon it. And I think that's one of the reasons God has blessed us so much. And number five, risky faith. If you ask me to describe North Point, I would say this church has always demonstrated risky faith. If you look at your Bible, from beginning to end, hasn't God always rewarded risky faith? Amen. Too many churches today, they want to play it close to the vest. 
they want to be very conservative. I don't know. Yeah, we've got $100,000 in the bank, but what if the water heater goes out? What kind of faith is that? Do you realize when we bought this property, we couldn't afford it? Do you realize when we went to the bank to get a loan, we really couldn't afford it? When we started the PRP campus, there were all kinds of, of doubts that I had in my mind. What if this happens or what if that doesn't happen? When we started our homeschool academy, I was scared to death. But God has always rewarded risky faith. And I think that's a huge reason why we can celebrate as we are today. Now let me say this as I wrap up. I heard about a man who needed to have his tooth pulled. The problem is, every time the dentist went to pull it with the pliers, he would clamp down on the pliers. Well, the man was coming back to the office, and the dentist told his assistant before he arrived, we're going to have to pull his tooth. But he always clamps down on the pliers and refuses to let me do it. If he clamps down today, here's what I want from you. You reach behind him, and you pinch his bottom as hard as you can. <laughs> the assistant said, what? He said, I'm serious. If you pinch his bottom, his mouth will open and I'll yank that tooth out. Well, sure enough, the man comes to the office. He clamps down on the pliers. The doctor gives the assistant the nod. The assistant reaches behind him and he just pinches his bottom as hard as he can. The man's mouth springs open. He takes those pliers and he yanks the tooth out. He then says to the man, now that wasn't so bad, was it? The man said, no, but I had no idea the roots ran so deep. <laughs> Let me tell you the greatest thing I can say about North Point. We may be a fairly new congregation, but I'm happy to say our roots run deep. Our roots run all the way back to the first century, back to the New Testament. And I think that's a reason that God has blessed us and is blessing us and will bless us as we've seen on display. In closing, happy anniversary, North Point. I'm humbled. Yeah, happy anniversary. I am truly humbled, almost overwhelmed to get to be a part of this with you. Don't take it for granted. Don't ever let up and always give God the glory. If you're visiting with us today, we invite you to stick around. If you notice there's a big tent behind the building, we're going to have a special love feast to celebrate God. We hope you'll stick around for that. But if there's anyone here today who needs to obey the gospel, if there's anybody who needs to get their life right with Jesus Christ, now's your chance. Come believing on the Lord, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. The power is not in the water, it's in the blood. But Romans 6, 3 says we're baptized into His death. Hence, it's in, his, it's in the waters of baptism that we contact the bloody shed. And you have that opportunity now. Or maybe you've done that, but you've sinned publicly and need our prayers the door is knocking. The Lord is standing outside. Are you ready to let him in? Now's the time as together we stand and sing.